welcome. Welcome to our discussion on securities. Uh, the structure of uh, this panel discussion is really focused on some of those key events uh, in a deal life cycle, right? From the time you're structuring a deal, uh, working with investors, compliance issues, uh, potential exit strategies and such. So that's what we're trying to do is uh, we've taken kind of a poll of questions that come up routinely from the practitioners and from our various groups and I think we've kind of prioritized what are the hot topics uh, right now. So uh, before I introduce the panel, just want to get kind of a temperature check from people in the room. Uh, who here has already sponsored a deal? About 30% or so. Okay. Who here has co-GP'd a deal with another sponsor? Great. Great, thank you. And who has participated in a joint venture uh, with another real estate investor? Okay, wonderful. So we wanna tidy up a couple terms today. Um, so, but before we get into that, let's introduce our panel here. You can really hear, great. <laughs> so uh, on, the far, on my far left, Kim Lisa Taylor, you may have met her outside. Uh, she's one of the sponsors of Best Ever and has a booth right outside the door. So if you haven't had a chance to meet her yet and get to know a little bit about her. She's a nationally recognized corporate securities attorney, speaker, and the author of the number one Amazon best-selling book, How to Legally Raise Private Money. She's the founder of Syndication Attorneys, PLLC, and InvestorMarketingMaterials.com and has been the responsible attorney for hundreds of securities offerings for clients who are raising money from private investors. Uh, currently offices in St. Petersburg, Florida. St. Augustine. St. Augustine. <laughs> Even One demerit for Byron, my apologies. Um, just to Kim's right is Stacy Bowers. Stacy Bowers is a professor of the practice and director of the corporate and commercial law program at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, where she teaches in the corporate and securities area. After graduating with her JD in 1992 from the University of Denver, she practiced for 15 years specializing in corporate and securities law. Stacy started her career at the US Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington, DC in the Division of Corporate Finance. She was securities counsel for two public companies during and after their initial public offerings and also worked in private practice for a number of years. And Dugan Kelly, uh, to my left, co-founded Kelly Clark PLLC with the mission to deliver big firm expertise and experience to the local community. He chairs the firm's real estate practice group, assisting clients in all phases of multifamily, commercial and residential acquisitions or sales. He routinely advises real estate investors about entity selection, corporate formation, risk assessment, and other related transaction, transactional needs. And he offices in Prosper, Texas. That's right. right. Good That's job. Wonderful. No demerit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Byron Elliott. I am uh, one of the attorneys in our local firm here, just about 20 miles south of Denver in Castle Rock, Colorado. So great opportunity to learn from, uh, from our peers here and to uh, dive into some of their experiences. So on the front end, when we talk about deal, deal structuring, we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, and Kim, I'm going to ask you this to lead us off. Uh, we're going to get into talk about co-sponsors and deal structuring and this and that and other ways to structure offerings with people that you want to partner with and whatnot. Um, but oftentimes there's confusion as to the distinction between a joint venture and a private equity raise or a syndication. So can you speak a little bit to that? Absolutely. So in a joint venture, all of the members have to be actively involved in generating their own profits versus a syndicate or a securities offering where you're actually selling securities to passive investors who are not actively involved in generating their own profits. They're relying on the management team to generate the profits on their behalf. And when they're doing that, then they're selling investment contracts to those investors, which are securities, and that falls into the realms of uh, securities law. That's wonderful, thank you. And then I'm gonna offer this up to the group, but I'm gonna start with Dugan. Um, because co-sponsorship structures right now, very hot topic. Side letters, co-GPs, co-managers, co-issuers. Right. Um, and so I know we get this question a lot, I'm sure you do as well. What are some of the additional roles that a, another co-sponsor can take on so that they're not being compensated just for raising money? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think it's one of the two biggest issues that most 
issuers or people associated with the issuer, sponsors, syndicators, operators, those terms are used interchangeably with one another. They struggle with how do we fall into this giant thing of issuer exemption. Unless you're, it's your, your deal, you're selling your part of your company and not for somebody else, then you fall outside this issuer exemption. So when we talk about co-sponsor, like everybody up here would say, you need to be a legitimate co-sponsor on the deal in order to take advantage of this issuer exemption. Everyone that syndicates throughout the country, regardless of whether you're syndicating a donut shop or a billion dollar acquisition of a skyscraper, wants to fall into that issuer exemption unless you're using a registered broker dealer. So the idea of having multiple general partners on a deal, that's fine, but they can't just be there to raise money and get a fee. They have to have a substantial role inside that organization. Ideally, you would be able to do that before you started raising money, i.e. selling securities. You would have set responsibilities and roles that carried through it through the life cycle of the deal. So I think that's, that's very important for people to understand that you can't just buddy up with somebody, raise capital, get a fee, uh, and then exit stage right. You really have to have some other substantial role inside that deal in order to be compliant throughout the life cycle of the deal. So Stacy, could you give us some examples of how you would assign different responsibilities across a co-GP team? Sure, I think one of the things that we see a lot too is with co-GPs, one of them sort of wants to be the lead on the investment side, one of them wants to be the lead on the operation side, and that's okay, I mean clearly the, the co-GP that's leading on the operation side, they're truly part of the business, they're managing the property, they're managing all those aspects. The problems often arise with the co-GP that wants to sort of handle the investment process because again, that can't be their sole job, just to come in and raise the capital and get, get their fees for raising that capital. So one of the ways to structure that and to build it out a little bit is it's, of course, they're there to help raise the capital, but then they're also there to manage the investor relation process, that ongoing process of communicating with the investors, keeping them informed, preparing the reports, being accessible to those investors to have conversations so that the role becomes that they are involved in the day-to-day -day running of this business. They're just not part of the operating of the property, but they're filling other aspects that are more than just being that person that comes in to help with capital raising. So pretty common, and probably there's a handful of groups in here that are looking to do something like a co-GP model. And I, I would ask him if you could share kind of a best practice on how do you codify the terms and conditions or the agreement between these co-GPs? Is there a particular format you use, a particular document? How do you approach that? One of the things we suggest is that you actually create a scope of work or a job description for each person in the GP and attach it to the uh, manager's operating agreement, right? Attach it to the GP operating agreement so that it's very clear that, you know, here's the expectation of the role that you're going to fill. I've also seen uh, others use uh, kind of an agreement that says here's a co-GP agreement and these are the responsibilities and roles that we expect you to participate in. Uh, so I've seen it happen both ways. Wonderful, thank you. Um, big topic this weekend has been for the last year and some changes. Um, you know, the difference between a single syndication, right, which is kind of the natural progression, find an apartment complex, we're gonna syndicate this and then move into a fund structure. Um, and Dugan, I'll ask you this, what do you see as the, the benefits of a fund structure, or maybe the pros and cons between that and a single syndication? Right, so we did four billion, our, our small office did four billion in transactions, structured transactions last year. And the vast majority of that was still in the meat and potatoes of the syndication space, 506B or 506C. Typically, or historically, at least over the last 20 years that I've been practicing, the retail investor in our space, what we love, commercial real estate, really it hasn't been terribly attractive for them to invest in what we call a blind pool, right? Here's my money, right? You take it out here and invest it in whatever you think is appropriate. 
That typically has not been attractive because most retail investors are not REIT investors. They want to know what's the apartment building, what's the self-storage facility, what's the mobile home park that you're actually going to use my money to invest in. That is still predominantly, at least in my practice with my clients around the country, what is most attractive. But as you get more of a track record as a, as a season sponsor and, you get, and you're building your list, your investor list, and maybe you've gone full cycle on a number of deals and you decided that you wanted to do a fund structure, that helps you the ability to invest into other people's deals, right? That's called a fund of fund structure. And so while you might not have a significant deal flow in the market in which might be appealing to your investor base, the fact that you've created a fund allows you to still uh, use those investors to tap into that market that you might not be positioned personally to be a general partner or a sponsor in. And it allows you to take fees legitimately, compliantly, because you're, you're managing that fund and still be treated as an investor in that fund. So there are pros and cons, but I would say in general, at least for my clients, they're still looking at that kind of that meat and potatoes of syndication of either a single identified asset or a portfolio of identified assets inside of a, a single raise. So I want to come back to the fund of funds discussion in a second, but uh, Kim, do you have any additional input as to the trends that you're seeing out of your office? I wholeheartedly agree with Dugan. Uh, the specified offering is the easiest way to raise money. We have clients that have done many, many, many deals and they're still doing the specified off offering model. Uh, we have had some that have done many, many deals and tried a couple of times to do a fund and abandoned it because they just found out that their investors didn't like it. They liked investing in, in single uh, specified things. So uh, I'm seeing the same thing that yeah. uh, Dugan has seen. Okay, great. So when we talk about a fund, you know, we have funds that are raised for that sponsor to invest in a particular asset or a portfolio of assets. So they're investing in real estate. This fund of fund model is the way you described it. Um, the, the sponsor or the fund manager then has the uh, discretion to invest in other securities offerings, right? So does that bring on any additional issues to be concerned about? And I'll ask you, Stacy, to, to lead that question off. Sure, I mean, I think the thing to think about in the fund to funds model is that the, the people who are raising the fund, the blind pool fund, so yeah. to speak. And I would say, you know, one of the things we see with clients too is that, you know, they specified a, a certain sponsor. So they're gonna raise money into what is a blind fund, but they're gonna deploy those funds into probably one particular sponsor. So there is some knowledge there, but, but that's a securities offering in and of itself. So understanding, you know, as you're raising that fund of money that you're gonna have the power to deploy, that's a securities offering that has to comply with all the obligations, just like you would if you were doing a single syndication. And then also being cognizant of, you know, making sure the disclosures you're providing to your investors who are coming into that fund, that they truly understand what you're probably going to be doing with that money, because to both of my um, co colleagues up here, their point of view is a lot of times investors, they're not comfortable with the blind fund but they might be comfortable with the idea of, okay, you're raising money and you're just gonna deploy it with this one particular sponsor, and that allows them to still feel like they know where their money's going and to have that control. I'm not sure if that was the no, answer you were looking for. No, that's for. wonderful. <laughs> any, other, any other issues when you get into the ambit of the fund of funds investing in other securities that you guys would like to highlight? I think it's I think a lot topic. of operators, they, they forget that you're changing from the Securities Act to now you're under the Investment Advisors Act. And there are certain limitations when you're doing a fund to fund model, like how many investors you can actually have. You can't have unlimited investors like you have in a Reg D offering, right? Or you're gonna, uh, unless you're gonna do like the hedge fund exemption, which pushes the net worth and liquidity of your particular investors over like $5 million. So the reality is that there are certain limitations, but Stacy's absolutely right. The sponsors that I've had that have been successful in the fund to fund model have identified a, another identifiable sponsor who's currently doing an acquisition and they're raising money, they're creating a limited liability company most often, raising money to deploy that money 
into that specified offering so that their investors actually believe, okay, I see it. We're going into Florida. We're going into the Carolinas. We're going into Georgia to invest into this one opportunity. That's a way that you could take advantage of that because maybe the fund sponsor hasn't been asked to be a legitimate sponsor or a co-sponsor, a general partner on the main deal, and they still need to be able to be compensated. So how can you be compensated unless you do that fund to fund model? So that's, I think, one of the benefits of being able to do that. I think another issue that crops up with the fund to funds too is for the, the people running the, the fund that's investing is making sure that whatever fees are flowing through to their investors are better than if their investors could invest directly. So I think part of what crops up too is understanding those economics and the waterfalls and making sure it even makes sense to come in in that fund to fund model as well. So, so that's a great point. And, and a question I think that comes up quite often is, if we're setting up a fund to invest in another offering, what are my disclosure requirements from what I would call the parent offering? Right? What do you have to disclose to investors and how readily accessible do you need those materials to be? And Kim, I'll ask you what your well, opinion is. And I is. think you always have an obligation when you're selling securities to give the investors all the information they need to make informed consent. And so part of that is who are the people that are ultimately in charge of this deal and uh, you know, what, what is the advantage to your investors to investing through you versus investing directly in that deal? And maybe it's because there's some monetary threshold that you're able to meet through your fund that they couldn't meet if they invested directly uh, or something like that. But I think those are things that have to be thought about. But you know, there are some red flags with these fund of funds, and, and I will have to say that every time someone asks me, I want to do a fund of funds, I, I kind of internally cringe a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> because my first thought is, uh, you know, what are you investing in? And, and the people that I've, many people I've talked to here have said, uh, you know, I, I want to do it because I can't find any deals. Well, so what makes you think that that person found a better deal than you? Maybe they're doing the deal that you turned down. And uh, yet you're going to put somebody else's money in their deal. So I, I think you have to be really careful and cautious about uh, your motivations behind this. If your whole motivation is just because I have investors and I want to invest in something, that might not be the quite right motivation. So you mentioned um, you know, the waterfall distributions and, and fee structure in this fund of fund model. Um, both in the context of fund of funds, but maybe just offerings generally, what kind of what kind of trends are you seeing as far as a, a distribution scheme or a waterfall that's popular right now? Uh, I'm seeing a lot of 70-30 uh, splits. We see more people going back to a straight split model than what we have in, in past years. Uh, I'm seeing uh, you know, still a lot of 7 or 8% preferred returns for some of our other clients. Um, uh, still 70-30 splits or 75-25 splits. You know, those are both very, very common scenarios. Also seeing people who are starting to create maybe two classes of investors, where one's a fixed return class that can be bought out early. Maybe they get a slightly higher return, but they're in a preferential position. Maybe they even get their capital back first. And then uh, a second tier that's the equity class. Uh, so just seeing a lot of that. Um, one of the things that we always encourage is a class B catch up. And I, I know there's a lot of attorneys that maybe don't agree with me on that. but. Uh, you know, so that's just another trend that we start to see. Can you expound on that, the Class B catch-up? Yeah, so the Class B catch-up is really just a way to do a straight split from the beginning, but you're understanding that in the first you know, one to three years that you have that property where you're repositioning it and you're increasing your rents and getting it stabilized, maybe you don't have that 8% preferred return to give to your investors from the cash flow just by giving them their 70%. So then you as a sponsor are going to give up some of your carried interest or your promote in order to get them to 8%, but retaining the right to recapture that when there's a capital transaction down the road. So that you're actually looking back all the way to the beginning and saying, okay, you know, what would it have been? How much would we have gotten had we gotten that 70-30 split from the beginning? Equalizing that out uh, before you're starting to make your final distribution. Great. And then, Dugan, I'm going to go back to the fund of funds model. So when a client comes in and suggests that they want to do a fund of funds, in terms of the economics of a parent offering, where does that make sense? Where would you advise a fund of funds works and where does it not work? 
Well, first and foremost, I want to know what their, their track record has been and what their expectations are for their investors. So, you know, if you're, like Kim said, if you're tar starting to just take, create a fund just because you have investors who have money burning a hole in their pocket, and you want to deploy that, but you have no deal flow, at what point are your investors going to expect a return on their investment, right? The clock, the meter is going to start running at some point once that capital goes into that operating account. And so first and foremost, it has to be appropriate. And then, um, like, like the panel's alluded to, the reality is you need to disclose, 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 disclose. The, you know, in the litigation realm, the areas in which sponsors have gotten caught or in trouble, hot water, the most amount of times is lack of disclosure. So the fact that you're gonna charge a, a scrape, an equity placement uh, scrape on top of your fund to model and the lead sponsor or the master fund is charging an acquisition fee, right? That you need to know, that your investors need to know that that equates to the same. The same thing with an asset management fee at the top level. And if you're charging like an annual asset under management fee of a 2% or a 2 and 20 split, which is very common in the institutional hedge space. If you're doing that, your investors need to know that they're essentially paying 2% here and then and their fund that they invested in that you deploy that capital is also paying a fee. So the fees, in my opinion, need to be first and foremost highlighted for the investors. Now, it still might be appropriate for the fund to fund to exist because the investors might not have a relationship. They might not be able to directly invest in the parent fund. Uh, and, and I have lots of clients that have groups that they say, hey, I know, like, and trust you. I'm gonna invest with you. I don't know who these people are, but I trust you, so I will invest and I'm fine with paying a point and a half or two points on my money when I place it with you. That's fine, but it's more of a transparency, right? Honesty, integrity, right? It, the, secure, the whole securities arena may seem complicated and certainly there are lots of rules and regulations, but don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, right? Yeah, and don't omit. Don't and omit. don't omit. <laughs> do what your mama told you to do when you were young and you'll be, for the most part, fine. If you don't, and you do any of those things, then you're gonna potentially have to look over your shoulder. And we don't want, nobody up here wants any of their clients to have to look over their shoulder, ever. So we want you to be compliant, but you gotta, you gotta be able to know that it's appropriate for you and for your investors. That's great, that's great. Another uh, hot topic right now is the notion of side letters. Um, going back to the discussion of co-GPs and structuring deals in that manner, um, when a client comes to talk to you about a, a side letter uh, in the context of a co-GP relationship, what are some of the things that you'd think about uh, as far as that goes? I guess, Kim, I'll, I'll send this down your way. So, so the side letter is typically used when you're going to give some kind of a preference or some, uh, something different to one party, which may be like a, a group that's coming in and bringing in a substantial amount of money. Uh, versus what you're offering to all of your other investors. Uh, the SEC is, is really starting to take a hard look at that and uh, they're, they're thinking about regulating that on, on certain levels. Um, but you know, the, the purpose of the side letter is so that you do have the ability to maybe take something away from what you're giving, what you're getting as the manager or promoter of the offering and giving it a share of that to someone else in order to boost their return beyond what they would get if they just invested directly in your fund alongside everybody else. So that's you know, really typically how that works. Uh, you know, I've had people come to me and say, can I have multiple side letters? And I, you know, my response is you know, only if you're crazy, and no, I don't recommend that. Uh, but you know, could you have a, a side letter with uh, one group that's bringing in a larger amount of money? Uh, yeah, yes, we've seen that done uh, quite commonly. Yeah, so why do you, why do you suppose there are going to scrutinize a side letter more now than they have in the past. So, so the rationale in the articles that I read about it and when the proposals that I read were that they don't like the idea that some investors are getting preferential yeah. treatment over the others and uh, you know so I think they see it more as a disclosure issue yeah. that so. you need to be able to tell all the other investors oh by the way you're getting eight percent preferred returns but I just offered this guy ten 
and here's why. And maybe in some cases the investors won't care. It's like, well, he's bringing in a million and a half dollars so we can actually get this deal done. They'd be like, sure, fine. But if they don't know about it, you know, the situation you're trying to avoid in your disclosures is somebody later on saying, I wouldn't have invested with you if I'd known that, okay? Because anytime that situation arises, you're in trouble. And uh, so you're always trying to circumvent that by sharing it and getting their consent if you're gonna deviate from something that you've offered them in the past. Wonderful. So we're gonna talk a little bit now, uh, getting into the investor side of the house and some compliance concerns. Uh, circling back to 506B, 506C, and which offering you would propose when a client comes in. So a client comes to you and says, I'm considering a 506C or a 506B, and Stacy, I'm gonna ask you this, what are, how would you advise that client if they're gonna proceed one way or the other, and then the timing of making the election of which exemption they're looking for? Sure, are you all ready to sit back and listen to the securities law professor for like two hours on this topic? Because yeah. um, I could definitely feel that. So I think there are a couple of concerns here, and I think a lot of people in the room understand them. So with a 506B, you can have accredited and non-accredited investors, but if you want to do a B offering, before you make that first offer, you need to have a pre-existing substantive relationship with all of your investors. There's a misperception that it's just with your non-accredited, but it's with all of your investors because it's that pre-existing substantive relationship that allows you to talk to investors and do a 506B without violating the general solicitation rules because you're not allowed to engage in general solicitation with a B. So if you wanna do a B because you wanna bring in non-accredited investors and at the same time take advantage a little bit of the idea that your accredited investors just have to self-certify, I think that's a good idea, but you need to be cognizant of the fact that you have to have that relationship with all of your investors before you make that first offer. Because once you draw that line in the sand, you can't bring somebody in that you don't have that pre-existing substantive relationship with. On the other hand, the 506C, you can engage in general solicitation and advertising, which is great, you can get the word out, but you have to jump through extra hoops because you're limited to accredited investors and those investors have to go through a more a vetting process to make sure they truly are accredited investors. So you lose that ability to have them self-certify. You have to make sure they truly meet the accredited investor definition status, whether that comes from a letter from their CPA, their investment advisor, or the issuer hires a third party that vets their tax returns or something along those lines. But the nice thing about a C is you don't have to have that pre-existing substantive relationship. So I feel like there, there are pros and cons to each of them, and I think it depends on, you know, what do you think your investor pool is going to look like? If you, if you think you're going to need non-accredited investors, then five, or you want to bring them in because you want to bring in some friends or family or associates who aren't at that accredited investor threshold, you just need to make sure you understand what you need to do before you make that first offer and trigger the launch of that offering. So you said substantive about five times, <laughs> but I still, don't, I still don't know what that means. <clears throat> sure, I don't think any of us really know what it means to have a substantive relationship. The SEC likes to do this. They like to put a rule out there and they, they're not sure what they mean by it and they're gonna see how it plays out. Um, I think substantive is not a five minute conversation in the hallway out here, for those of you who have had those over the past couple days. Substantive is I've had a couple of conversations with, with somebody, hopefully maybe you've had some in-person conversations with them. At a certain point, you should have an investor questionnaire that you've really walked and talked to them about. What is your experience? What are your prior investments? Um, you know, do you understand risks and those kind of things? So it's a relationship that you need to have built over time. And so again, it's not, you know, one 15 minute call. Maybe it could be substantive. I don't think so. I think you need to have multiple conversations and reach that point where you understand what kind of investor is this? What are they looking for? What are their opportunities? And then sort of that vetting of them, just their knowledge and their experience and sophistication as well. But the SEC has not provided any kind of bright line test it's about true. what it means to be substantive. And so I would also say in conjunction with that, make sure you're keeping track of these relationships that you're building. So if the SEC ever comes knocking on your door and says, 
show us that you have a substantive relationship. You have an Excel spreadsheet or some kind of tracking that you can pull out and say, look, I had seven different conversations with this person. I have an investor questionnaire that either they filled out and we talked through or we did it as we were meeting and I kept a copy of it. So do your homework and make sure that you can substantiate that substantial relationship. Very good, thank you. We're gonna pivot back to 506C offering now. Suppose we've settled on a 506C offering. Lots of discussion now about the new updates from the SEC in terms of third party verification, how long it's good for, um, and I know there's a lot of confusion out in the field. So, so Dugan, I'm gonna tee this up for you. Okay. <laughs> um, how do you in interpret the five-year certification? And then a, a common question is, especially when people are going to co-GP, yeah. if I've done an investor verification over in this one offering, and now I'm coming over to another offering as a co-GP, yeah. can I? does that last for five years? What's your take? Yeah, so my take, I, I totally agree with Stacey, <laughs> the SEC gives us these amorphous, vague rulings, or no rulings, really, and we have to decipher what do you mean? And they issue these no action letters, essentially saying, we're not gonna take action against this person and it's, we're gleaning guidance from these things. But I'm super stoked about some of the things that I've seen that the commission has recently come out. And this is one of them. So historically, why you've seen such a massive gap between what people are doing in 506B versus 506C, it hasn't even been close. It's like 90% over in 506B land and 10% over in 506C land. And the reason why is because most people don't want to open their kimono and say, this is how rich I am. Prove it. <laughs> Show me your tax returns. Give me access to your bank records. That's very difficult for, very, for sponsors and operators to have those conversations with potential investors. But the SEC has said, if, if you do that, if you actually go through that due diligence process that Stacy was talking about, and you have independently verified the accredited status of your investors, that used to be good for only 90 days. And then it was stale. So, you know, this is a rinse and repeat game. So investors that invest with you and then you get another deal, theoretically six months down the road, you had to go back and do that same thing and independently verify that they were accredited. And they couldn't just check a box and self-certify that they were still rich. Well, the SEC has said, if, if you do that due diligence and you have done your homework and they are independently verified as an accredited investor, now we're going to benefit you and we're going to allow this to be good for at least five years. That's massive. That's massive. Very few things in our industry actually change. So when things do change, we all take notice of it, right? And so now sponsors that have an existing list and now they decide to do another offering six months later they can tap those same investors my take is that that carries forward that homework that you did as part of that issuer uh, to vet those uh, investors remember the public policy behind this is wanting to make sure investor protectionism there's a natural tension between injecting private capital into the market and also protecting investors. But if you've gone forward and actually done that, then that's good for five years. So I am a, I'm a big fan of the changes that the commission has recently made. I think it's making it more accessible for people that have largely been disenfranchised and have not had access to the capital markets to be able to do deals now. Uh, and so I hope that they continue to make more changes like this. Uh, going forward. So in the beginning of that, you described a, a scenario. So you take a, a, a sponsor who's got a mature investor base and they're doing deals by themselves time and time again. So that works out very, very well. But in terms of somebody who wants to co-GP a deal uh, and they've done you know, the third party verification to feel comfortable with that in a previous offering, they come over and join up with another team as a co-sponsor. Uh, are you of the opinion that that's okay to pull that investor list and that five-year verification is still good in the context of a, a co-GP? Yeah, my, my position is yes, because otherwise you're telling, you're basically admitting that that co-sponsor is not a legitimate co-sponsor on the deal. They're not selling their own securities. So if you're a legitimate co-sponsor on the deal, 
it's my deal. Just like it's Stacy's deal. Just like it's Kim's deal. It's all of our deal. And we're selling our own securities to our investors. And while uh, Stacy might not have a relationship with my investors, I do. And she has a relationship with her investors and Kim does with her investors. And so if Kim joins our team, it's Kim's deal just like it's my deal. Now maybe the splits might not be the same inside that GP operating agreement, right? Maybe the, the equity split might be different, but I'm a big believer that just because you have a, let's say 2%, 5%, 10% of the GP, that doesn't make it any less significant, important, or legal from the standpoint of compliance. Now I may be an outlier in that, but that's my, that's my position because otherwise, what would be the point, right? You'd be basically saying, well, that doesn't, it applies to everybody, it applies to Kim and Stacy, but it doesn't apply to Dugan, you're out, right? That doesn't make any sense from my perspective. Okay, great. So we're getting a little tight on time. I wanna ask uh, a couple questions related to foreign investors. And uh, just a reminder to the audience, if you have additional questions, the panelists will be available uh, back behind this wall in the next room. Um, after the after discussion, so foreign investors is coming up now. Uh, a potential sponsor comes into your office, Kim, and says, "I have foreign investors, Canada, Israel, whatever else it may be. What are some of the the things that you consider when taking foreign money?" So there, there's several. Uh, one is, you know, do you know these people? Because if you don't know them, then you don't know if they're maybe trying to use you for some illicit uh, money laundering scheme. And uh, once you get caught in that, your life is pretty well over. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so number one, do you know these people and should you really be taking their money? Um, number two is, are you soliciting investors in their country because their country may have securities laws very similar to ours that you have to comply with, and especially if you have a representative in that country that's, that's soliciting those investors. Uh, third, um, you need to think about the tax implications because there's going to be, uh, there's something called the, if, if it's a real estate deal, there's a Foreign Investment and Real Property Tax Act of 1980 that's going to apply, where you're going to have to withhold some taxes from their distributions before you send it out of the country. And uh, if you do it wrong, the person who uh, signs the check remains personally and primarily responsible for the tax owed by that investor if they don't voluntarily pay it. So the withholding is that you actually take a portion of their distribution before you send it out of the country and you uh, give it to the IRS. Uh, they are uh, supposed to get their own foreign taxpayer identification number in the US in order to be able to make that investment here. A lot of your foreign investors don't want to do that uh, because then that has some other tax implications for, for them and some of their worldwide income, so they don't want to even go there. Uh, so you've got to just be cautious about that. Um, a lot of times also, they'll just, it, there's a problem getting the money here, right? So from certain countries, you may never get it here. I had a Russian client several years ago that just finally gave up because he couldn't get the money here. I mean, imagine him trying to do that right now. Uh, that would be pretty difficult. So you've got to think about those considerations, you know, the taxes, the securities implications of, of their, their laws. Uh, and then also here, there is an exemption called Regulation S that applies to those non-US persons, but they truly have to meet the definition of a non-US person for that regulation to apply. And that means that they can't be a US citizen, they can't live in the US, they can't be a US legal resident, and they're wiring their funds from an offshore account. And they have to meet all four of those tests. So if their money's already here in an LLC that they own, then, uh, then you would treat them like any other US investor. And so they would still have to qualify. Uh, one of the advantages of Reg S that some people like is that there are no financial qualifications for uh, Regulation S investors, so you don't have to worry whether they're accredited or they're not accredited, although I will say that if you're doing a 506C offering, it is standard practice that if you have only accredited investors in the U.S. that you would make sure those non-U.S. investors are also accredited. But how do you do that? It, it, it can be tricky. So, you know, there's a lot of things to think about. Um, if you're doing a 506B offering, and you're also going to include non-accredited investors, then you, you, know, you can include the 506B and the Reg S provisions in your same private placement memorandum, but you're probably going to have to have a different subscription agreement for those non-US investors. If you're doing a 506C offering where you're actually advertising in the US, then you actually have to have a separate set of offering documents 
for those REGAS investors because you're not allowed to advertise a REGAS offering in the US. So you really have to kind of separate them. They can invest in the same company. So a lot of different considerations, but the biggest one is the taxes, so I think, because that's the one that becomes a deal breaker, right? Their returns are going to be significantly different than your U.S. investors because of the withholding. And the only way that they could get that withholding back is uh, if they actually, uh, there's a tax treaty between the U.S. and their country that allows that, so. Well, so my takeaway from that is seek counsel. <laughs> seek, and seek international tax advice. Have and a good international CPA. tax advice. That was, yeah. that was wonderful. Thank you. So we're a little tight on time. I'm going to skip to, I can't say the lightning round, can I? Um, <laughs> for, each, for each member of the panel here, can you give the audience your best ever tip on staying out of hot water, uh, really from a compliance perspective? Stacy, I'll start with you. Uh, with a 506B, talk to your lawyer before you do anything. Good point. <laughs> Develop relationships with all of your investors. You're develop you're, you're getting into a partnership mm -hmm. with people for the next five to seven years, and you better make sure that you like them and they're not horrible people because they could ruin your life. This is a team sport. So the fact that you are here meeting other people that might be long life strategic partners for you, that's amazing. So remember, don't lie, don't cheat, and don't steal. And you'll be fine. Wonderful. Thank you. That was that was great content. Let's get a round of applause for our <laughs> panel members.